We want to wish everyone on behalf of the OU family a very meaningful and wonderful Pesach. We look forward to a meaningful Pesach for all of us, for you, your family, for the Jewish people, and for humanity. This morning, we're going to be speaking about a number of issues related to the Seder, first and foremost, but they're not only Seder themes, they're, they're themes related to the Seder that you can apply really to throughout the Jewish year. The, many of the themes we're going to deal with actually come from Rabbi Soloveitchik, from his teachings. And the first is this. We have an interesting dichotomy grammatically in the, in the Seder itself. On the one hand, it says, Avadim hayinu lefaro b'mitzrayim. We were servants or slaves to the Pharaoh, meaning to Pharaoh and the Egyptian government in Egypt. Avadim hayinu lefaro, the dative sense, the dative text. Then we have Avde Hashem, Halalu Ka Halalu Avde Hashem. Who should, who should express Halal? The servants of God. In the possessive, one is the dative, Avadim Hayinu Lifaro, the other is Avde Hashem, in the possessive. What's the difference? And that's a question to think about. It's not just a technical grammatical nuance, right? How many of us have nightmares when we go back to fourth or fifth grade grammar, not understanding our dative and possessive tenses? But the reality is, that is going to show us a profound insight into the nature of where the Jewish people were at. Question number one. Question number two is the following, and that is this. See, we're biased by Cecil B. DeMille. I think we're also biased very often, you see, on the parochas, this image of the burning bush, hasne einenu ukal. The bush was not consumed. What does it look like? It's like the bush is, is consumed in fire. It keeps, the fire keeps burning. But that's really not the image that Hashem conveyed to Moshe. When Moshe said, Asura na ve'era es hamare hagadol, I want to turn away and see this awesome, this great sight. What was the great sight that Moshe saw? It wasn't the burning bush in Cecil B. DeMille's imagery. It was what? It was tumbleweed. And inside the tumbleweed, in the gap, in the space, in the vacuum of the tumbleweed, that's where the fire burnt. To quote Rashi, when he says on the Pasuk, Bilabat esh, Bilabas esh, in the heart. It stayed where? In the vacuum or in the airspace, which is a defiance of the laws of physics. Because according to the laws of physics, you know, fire needs fuel to burn. Fire needs some kind of fuel so that it can consume it. And that's not what happened here. You had the, the thickle, the tumbleweed on the outside, the external trappings. And inside is what? Inside is where the fire burns. So here's the question. How, what kind of image is that? It defies the laws of physics, but what kind of image was HaKadosh Baruch Hu, was the Almighty showing Moshe Rabbeinu? That's question number two. The grammatical question, the image of the Sneh. Before we answer those questions, let's go back earlier into Moshe's life. He's the Prince of Egypt. This is the man who could become the next Pharaoh. The reality is, he could become the next Pharaoh, the leader of the free world, of the civilized world. And what happens? He throws it all away. Vayar besivlo sam. Why? Because of his concern, because of his sympathy and empathy. For who? For these wretched slaves. Nebuch, these people who are suffering. These people who are, are being downtrodden. And he's bothered and he's hurt by the way they're being treated. And he leaves the beautiful atmosphere of the palace, the life of luxury, of comfort. And he goes into the slubber, I should say, into the slums where the slaves are. And he sees a terrible scene. He sees a nogesh, an Egyptian taskmaster, beating to death a Jewish slave. Oh, he looks, vayifen ko vacho. What's ko vacho? Strange terminology. He should say vayifen po vasham. He looked here, he looked there, vayar kienish, and he saw there was no one. That's not what the Torah says, vayifen ko vacho. What's the term ko? So the Rav explained very often, you see this term, it's a term of Jewish destiny. The Kalir in, in, in Eiko, the 13th of the Kinos, he takes the various places where the term Ko comes up in the Chumash and in, in Tanakh. Ko Amar Hashem, right? It's a term of, it's a nevuah, where this is the destiny, this is something, an insight into the future of the Jewish people. So he looks, what's Ko Vacho? He sees when he kills this man, this Egyptian taskmaster, he understands he's not only killing him, the Russia, he's also killing any child that he would ever produce, any grandchild, any great-grandchild, he looks into future generations and he knows the ramifications of the act. What else is Vayif and Kovacho? He looks into his own future. If he does nothing, if Moshe does nothing, 
and he allows this atrocity to take place, so there'll be a dead Jew. But you know what? Maybe in 10 or 20 or 30 years, the prince of Egypt will become the next pharaoh. And then he can help not one Jew, he can help hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of Jews. But if he lets this event take place, he allows an innocent man's blood to be shed. He allows an innocent victim to be murdered. Vayifen ko vacho. Moshe looks at what this is going to do to his personal status, what this is going to do to his future. And he goes and he saves the life of an innocent victim. And what happens? Nebuch. No good deed goes unpunished. No good deed goes unpunished. And Dasan and Aviram, that's our tradition, two Jews rat him out to the government. Two Jews go to the government and they say, look at this. You know, supposedly this is your prince of Egypt. This is the royal prince. Look at what he did. He turned on his own country, on his own government to help a Jew. These are Jews saying this against Moshe who risked his life to help another Jew. And Moshe has to flee. He flees for his life. He becomes a fugitive. He becomes a fugitive and he leaves Egypt. Where does he go? Well, if you were going to leave the great empire of Mitzrayim, and we know Mitzrayim is not some North African continent. Mitzrayim is, you're talking about a third of the, Af the northern third of the African continent. Where does he go? He could go through the Via Maris to Mesopotamia, or he can go south to Kush. Kush is Central Africa. Kush is Central Africa. And what happens there? What happens in Kush? Kush, which today you'd call uh, Uganda, Ethiopia, Kenya, Eritrea, that area. The Medrash says, well, first, first and foremost, before we say what happens there, the Torah doesn't say a word. You know, we talk about, for, for instance, the missing the 18 minutes of the Watergate tapes. Wouldn't we love to know what was on those 18 missing minutes of the Watergate tapes? Well, there's about a 50-year period, a 55-year period in the lifetime of Moshe Rabbeinu where we don't have a word. The Torah is mum. There's not one word as to what happened during that time. Medrash fills in. Now, Medrash very often, I heard Rabbi Rosenblatt describe, is opposed to the Torah being, let's say, a piece of cloth. You view the Torah almost as a piece of lace, meaning there are gaps, there are holes. And what the Medrash does is it weaves its way through those holes and those gaps. It asks those questions and it addresses the gaps, that's the, the material that's not written in the Torah. We always refer to the Torah as black fire on white fire. There's as much to be learned from the space, i.e. that which is not written, that does not have D.O. or ink conveyed, but that is a gap that is missing. That tells us as much as what is written. And the Medrash fills it in for us. The Medrash says that he goes there, he becomes a, they, they realize who this man was, the great aristocrat from Egypt, a wise, a thoughtful, a great person, and they bring him into the government. And he transforms our society. He improves economically in terms of values, morals, ethics, in terms of justice. He transforms the world of Kush and eventually becomes the prime minister, the leader of Kush. And you know what's strange? Had it not been for this Medrash, we would never know one word. We'd never know one thing about the fact that Moshe was in Kush all of those decades. And what's also strange is he has no destiny. He has no legacy. What was the impact of Moshe's legacy on, on Kush? Seems like there was none long term. Seems like there was none at all. And Moshe, after his time in Kush, comes to Midian. He becomes the CEO of the great cattle baron Kohen Midian Yisro, of his flocks, of his herds, and of course the incident of the, of the great Mare Haggadol, the incident of the Sneh. So there's four questions at this point we need to answer. I apologize before we answer those questions, there's one fact I left out, very important fact. After Dasan and Aviram tell the government what Moshe has done by killing the Nogesh, the Egyptian taskmaster, Moshe says three words, achen noda hadavar. What does achen noda hadavar mean? Therefore, the matter is known. So you could say, therefore, the matter is known means what? That people know about what I've done, that I've killed an Egyptian to save a Jew. But there's a Gemara in Sota that Rashi quotes, fascinating medrash that Rashi quotes. It says, what's achen noda hadavar? The davar, the matter, the thing that has bothered me, that has perplexed me all these years, now I understand why. What was the matter? The matter, the davar, is 
theodicy. How could it be that the Jewish people, what did they do to deserve this? They're the most downtrodden of any people on the face of the earth. How could it be that Nebuch, this is the way they're treated? What did they do to deserve this? Tzadik Viralo, Russia Vitovlo. Why is it that terrible things happen to such good, decent, pious people? And when he finds out that when no good deed goes unpunished, and that here he risks his life, and what do they do? No good deed goes unpunished, they do what? They rat him out for risking his future, his life, to save a Jew? Now he understands why they are, and he throws his hands up, and he says, now I understand, achen no da hadavar. And he leaves, and he turns his back on the Jewish people. Enough. No, you know, what? I made my mistake once, and it cost me everything I have. Now I'm a fugitive. I'm going to go back. And he forgets about the Jewish people. And he makes his impact in Kush. When he gets to the Sne, when he gets to the Sne, the image that he sees is the following. Just to repeat. Tumbleweed, worthless wood. It's not firewood. It's not construction wood. It doesn't produce perot fruits. It's worthless. But there's a fire burning within it that defies the laws of physics. It's got no fuel, that can, you know, no fuel to feed the fire. And this is what he sees? And he's so strange. What was the image that the Almighty was showing to him? So the Rav said the following was the image. Moshe, when you said Achim no da davar, some five and a half decades ago, when you threw your hands up and walked away from the Jewish people, you misread them. On the surface, they're like the tumbleweed. They're like the sna. Doesn't produce fruit, doesn't produce construction material, firewood, nothing. But beneath that surface, Moshe, not the way do you, that you see things is the way that I, the Almighty, see things. Lo ke Moshe atatira. I see underneath that wretched surface, I see a fire, I see heat, I see warmth, I see light. And Moshe, it's your job to bring that fire from beneath the surface, to bring it to the fore, to bring it to the surface, to transform that heat, that light, and bring it out. You misread this people. And the Almighty debates with Moshe for a period of seven days. The Geula can't take place unless Moshe, the Goel, Hashem's partner, the Shliach HaKel, God's agent, will partner with the Rebona Sha'olam and do what? And bring it out to the fore and play that role. And what is that? What is that is the following. You've got to look at these people in a deeper way than you saw them before. You've got to look beyond the surface. You've got to look beyond that surface and bring out those people. Bring it to the fore. I need you. No, you may not be the greatest diplomat. No, you may not be this powerful king, the image that people think of. But you're Moshe Rabbeinu. You're a mentor. You're a sensitive soul. You're someone who is an aristocrat, who's dignified, who is a who knows how to conduct himself and can re react and relate to each and every one of them. You're the teacher par excellence. You're the role model par excellence. And you can bring the fire to the surface. You can bring the heat from its subterranean state. You can bring it to the fore. And when Moshe finally agrees, then Jewish history is irre irrevocably changed. Not just Jewish history, the destiny of humanity is irre irrevocably changed. Because with the transformation of this group of illiterate pagan slaves into the Dordea, into the generation of knowledge and wisdom, this very people, this very nation that Moshe nurtures and develops, they will transform all of humanity. That's the image of the Sneh. And the mistake that Moshe made was they were avadim hayinu lefaro b'mitzrayim. They were not avde faro. What's the difference between the dative and the possessive grammatical tenses? The dative means that economically and jurid juridically, they were owned by the state. They were the pharaoh's slaves on an economic juridic level. But in terms of what was their essence, who were they? What defined them? They were not avde faro. If they were avde faro, pharaoh's servants, then it's beyond the point of no return. Then there's no redemption. 
These people went from being Avadim Hayinu Lefaro Mitzrayim to Avdeh Hashem. But the definition, the hallmark, the bumper sticker of a Jew is that I'm a servant of God, God's servant. I belong to God. My life is dedicated, is committed, is, is owned by God. It defines me. I'm a godly human being. I'm an ethical human being. I'm a theologically, theologically perfected human being. That's Avdeh Hashem, as opposed to what? The economic status of Avadim Hayinu Lefaro B'Mitzrayim. That answers why is it so important in the Haggadah to define us differently as Avadim Hayinu, an economic status, but not our mahus, not our essence, versus Avdeh Hashem, which goes to the essence of the person. That's number one. The answer is to what was the image that the Almighty showed Moshe Rabbeinu? What was the Mar Haggadah? We explained that. And that changed Moshe's opinion. It changed the way he viewed the Jews. Just parenthetically, the reason why there's no mention of Cush in the Torah, those 50 missing years, is because the Torah is the book of the destiny of the Jewish people. The formation, the destiny, and, and the legacy. The legacy meaning the, the Torah, the philosophy and the law of the Jewish people. What Moshe does in Cush may be very important from a historical point of view, but in terms of the destiny of Am Yisrael, it plays no role, and that's why it's not mentioned. And then just to answer the other question that we left off with, what, what's the point of the Medrash? What is the Medrash teaching us? I'm sure Moshe must have been an amazing leader. And it was, by the way, it was during the young years of his life, the years of his vigor and strength. What is that Medrash teaching us? What's the Medrash teaching us? It's teaching us the following. That you know what? The Medrash is teaching us this. The destiny that Moshe gave humanity, the legacy that Moshe left humanity, it wasn't Moshe the person. Moshe the person, after he dies, two, three generations, no one remembers Moshe anymore. His impact, his legacy, it dissipates. Within a century, it's gone. Very similar to Avraham in the area of Turkey, Syria, when he was in Aram. But what was the difference between the, the variable between Moshe and Cush and Moshe with the Jews? Taurus Moshe. When Moshe leaves a system, the doctrine, the philosophy and values, the approach to life of the Torah, so long after Moshe is gone, his legacy is still there. Moshe is chai v'kayim, he's alive, he's living and breathing through the Torah. That was what he left. And that's a distinction as to why he changed humanity as the leader of the Jews relative to not being able to have a long-term effect as a leader in Kush. Now, that point, there's a fascinating tshuva of Rabbi Ashri in Chela Gimel of Shelus Uchuvos Mimama Kim, Chela Gimel Tshuva Vav. As you know, Rabbi Ashri was a young man in the Kovna Ghetto. Just to take a step back historically, Lithuania, which its two main cities, Vilna and Kovna in Polish, or Vilnius, Kovnius in Russian. And Kovna had a very Jewish suburb, Slobodka. The great yeshiva of Slobodka, the altar of Slobodka, as well as uh, Rabbi Baruch Ber, the Kamenetz yeshiva was there. In Slobodka, which is a suburb of, of Kovna, after Hitler violated the pact with Stalin, they had a pact from 39 to 41, and the German, the Wehrmacht, comes into Lithuania in 41 in the summer, and then followed shortly after by the SS, by the Gestapo. These Lithuanians, Lithuanian Christians who've been living with Jews in some cases for as much as 800 years, many of you know the famous Dr. Jaffa Eliach, her book on Aishashuk. It's a permanent exhibit at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And, and the Lithuanians, with a vengeance and with a... Uh, it's an undescribable, unbearable description of what they did to the Jewish people and what happened in Kovna and in Slobodka. And between the SS and the Lithuanians, they butchered hundreds, thousands of Jews before putting us into the Kovna ghetto. Rabbi Khanan Wasserman and his Talmidim died. The great... Dvar Avram, the Kovna Rav, who was the Godel at that time in Kovna, Avraham Dovber Kahana Shapira. He was an elderly man. Many of the tshuvas that Rabbi Ashri writes about, he goes to the Dvar Avram, the Kovna Rav, and, and he's Miyayitz with him. But the Kovna Rav dies shortly after this. 
In this Rabbi Ashri, who has a position of watching over the Jewish archives with the, the Sifri Torah, the whole warehouse with all the Judaica that's going to be sent eventually to Prague, where they make a museum to the distinct Jewish race, the, the extinct Jewish race, he becomes the Rav of the survivors the slave laborers whose wives and children have been killed, whose friends, whose neighbors have been killed, those who are remaining. And they ask him his shilas in 41, in 42, 43. And it's, it's just heart-wrenching reading the shilas. There are five volumes. Shilas Achuvos Mimama Kim, Rabbi Ephraim Ashri. Rabbi, this Rabbi Ashri, you should know, survived. He settled on the Lower East Side. He lived till the age of 92. He was the rabbi of the Beis Medrash Hagadol, a famous shul on the Lower East Side. And just reading the tshuvas, we're going to read one of the shalos now, which relates to this Devar Torah. In 41, one of the Jews, Lithuanian Jews from Kovna, come to him, and he describes his look. Thousands have been taken out to the seventh fort, the ninth fort, which was the equivalent of a Maginot line that the Russians had built, which is now being used as places to execute the Jews from the Kovna ghetto, the Kovna ghetto being in Slobodka, of course. And what happens? Tragically, this slave laborer comes to him. He says, how can I wake up and say B'Shemu Malchus every morning? I'm going to pray to the Ribbona Sha'olam. Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Alam. Shalom Asani Oved, that you have not made me a slave. He says, what we're going through in 41, under the pressure of the Nazis and the Lithuanians, this is worse than anything that the Jews underwent when we were slaves to the Pharaoh. How can I pray Shalom Asani Ovid? No way. Not a chance. And what happens? The ka- Rabbi Ashri, he says to him, he says, no. He says, the same Yesod that Rabbi Soloveitchik had. Financially, economically, we're slaves. We're prisoners and slaves of the Third Reich. And we're slave laborers, we don't determine our hours, we don't determine when we go to work, when we come home. Yes. But this bracha, Shalom Sani Ovid, is talking about a person's status. God forbid that the Germans should break us. The spirit of the Jew, the spirit that, that the Almighty has given us, the spirit of the Torah that defines and shapes and transforms a Jew, that can never be broken. And we can get up every morning, dafka here, in defiance, in an act of defiance, and say, Shalom Asani Ovid. God, you gave me the ability, the spiritual ability, to have the fortitude to withstand the Gehenim that I'm going through. That person is a Ben Chorin. That is the definition of a free person. So again, Shalom Asani Ovid is an economic juridic status. It doesn't define the personality. It doesn't define the persona. Our next point. Our next point is the use of one term in the Haggadah, the term Hamakom. Baruch Hamakom Baruch Hu. Baruch Shanasan Torah Le'amo Yisrael. It's a very strange Birkas It's a Birkas Torah in the middle of the Seder. Before we engage in the, the learning component of the Seder, before we get to the four sons, the Arba Abanim, we get to this Birkas Torah. So question number one is, why is our Birkas Torah there? Question number two is, What's Baruch HaMakom? Of all the terms we could use for the Almighty, Ribbonu Sha'olam Hashem, Melokim, Adoshem, all these different terms, what's HaMakom? That's question two. Before we answer those two questions, though, let's just take a, a digression and talk for a few moments about this idea of Kenegad Arba Banim, the four sons that the Torah speaks about. So, you know, there, there's a debate that rages in Jewish schools, in Gentile schools, throughout education, the educational world. What is that debate? Are we pro-tracking, what we'll called homogenous education? Are we a pro-non-tracking, heterogeneous classes? What are, what's the difference in a homogenous class, a tracking class, and a heterogeneous class? In a homogenous class, you have people with similar, similar proclivities, similar abilities, and you put them in classes. And what happens? It makes it much easier for the teacher to teach because instead of teaching to 20 levels, you're teaching to two or three levels. <coughs> similar students with similar abilities and backgrounds. That's the positive of tracking. What's the downside? The downside is, is that it leads to people having self-fulfilling prophecies. It leads to people having stereotypes. Stereotype number one, when the sweat hogs. We have no chance, we'll never succeed in life. 
We're not going anywhere. You know, we're the dummies. Now, we all know that 20, 25 years, when we look back, you know, at our schooling experience, it's usually the sweat hog class, they're the ones supporting the ones who are in the top class, right? The top class became the academicians, and they're living off of the business people. At that time, it wasn't diagnosed as ADHD or ADD. The reality is these people weren't dumb. These people were very creative. They just couldn't sit still. They think outside the box. They're not students, but they're students in the game of life. So what happens? What happens is the Iluyim, the top class, they have this notion, you know, we're God's gift to humanity. We're better. We're special. And they view themselves in a certain false way. And likewise, the lower tracks, they view themselves as self-fulfilling prophecy of, of not being able to succeed or accomplish. So there's a positive and a negative to tracking. And just the opposite is true in a heterogeneous class. On the one hand, everybody's together. The brightest and the not so bright are together. Everybody's there together. We're all in the same class. The downside is how do you teach a class like that? It makes it almost impossible to teach to eight or 10 or 12 different levels within one classroom. And that is the pro and con of each. Where does Judaism weigh in on this? I may not be correct, but I'm going to venture an approach. I believe that we're much closer to the tracking system with its challenges and downsides. We believe in that homogenous tracking system of what? Chanoch lenar al pidarko. How do you educate? According to the derech of each student, meaning for certain classes you're going to be concrete and tangible, for others more abstract. Certain are audio learners, certain are visual learners. And there's going to be formulated classes that relate to the strengths and the proclivities of each group. You really see this, Shlomo HaMelech's phrase, Chanoch Lenar Al Pidarko, where is it rooted, where is its foundation? I apologize, just the reason I'm stretching is I've got a problem with the neck, so we try, keep trying to raise that arm. What, what, where do you see this? You see this in the, the four sons. The Chacham, someone who's an abstract thinker conceptual thinker, knows how to analyze. Basically, any child from the age of nine and older, who's the Tom, or the Rambam refers to as the Tipesh, who's the Tom? A very concrete, tangible person. Can only relate to things in concrete, tangible ways. Can't formulate a question that well. He says, Mazos, what is this? As opposed to Ma Eidos Vachukim Vamishpatim. So what's the difference between the Chacham and the Tom? What's the difference between the Chacham and the Tom? What has is this. I, I just want to take a step back. What I said was correct when you're dealing with, with children, but you also have that with adults. You have certain people who think in conceptual, sublime, ethereal, abstract terms. You have others who think in very concrete, tangible terms. And you have to respond to each according to their proclivities. By the way, the Russia is, is really a chacham in terms of his intellectual abilities. Developmentally, the Russia is a chacham. But emotionally, the rush is challenged. The Chacham can be objective. The Chacham is open to a discussion, to going to, down a certain road, to looking into something. The rush, it says, They're telling. They're not open. Unless they have a certain, you know, we know people who have mental challenges. We know people who have physical challenges, physical handicaps. We know people who have emotional handicaps, emotional challenges. That's the Russia. And then you have She'eno Yodei Elishol can't even develop the question. The She'eno Yodei Elishol, if it's a child, they can't even ask the question. They're just not, developmentally, they're not there yet. We have adults like that. People who are apathetic. People who are, they're not dull because of their IQ. They just, they're not asking questions. They're not engaged. You know, She'eno Yodei Elishol. They just don't know how to ask the question. You know, they've been through it. They've seen it. They're not, they don't have fresh eyes, so to speak a fresh way of looking at things, the ability to, to delve, to open, to be curious anymore. So you have to have a different Seder for each and every one of these different learners. For each and every one of these different developmental or personalities, you've got to have a different Seder. Because if it's Chanoch Lenar Al Pidarko, if it's Keneged Dalet Bonim, Arba Bonim Dibra Torah, then by definition there are different Sedarim taking place at the same Seder. Let's go back now to our questions. So this is a unique learning opportunity, a very unique learning opportunity called what? Called Sipur Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, called the Seder. It's not your standard learning that we do every day. Every day we wake up, we make Birkas HaTorah. There's a Birkas HaTorah, and we learn throughout the day. 
immediate learning after the bracha, learning that takes place throughout the day. This is a unique, distinct type of learning, a unique, distinct modality with its own mitzvah. I'll use an analogy. We make Birkas Torah every morning, but if you get called on a Monday, Thursday, or Shabbos to the Torah, you get called for an aliyah to read from the Torah, you make a new Birkas Torah, because that's a unique, distinct learning. That, that, what's the uniqueness and distinctiveness? It's the reenactment of Mamad Harsina. It's the reenactment of the Harsina experience. It's a public learning. It's a public reenactment of conveying those ideas. So that has its own modality. It gets its own bracha. This, Seder night, has its own modality. It gets a Birka Satorah, special Birka Satorah. Baruch HaMakom Baruch Hu, Baruch HaSher Nasan Torah Le'amo Yisrael. What's Baruch HaMakom? What's that term, HaMakom? And by the power of association, what do we always associate? What do we always associate with HaMakom? HaMakom Yenachem Eschem B'Soch Shar Aveli Tzion V'Rushalayim. When you go to the base of El, when you go to the mourner, you say, Hamakom, that term for God. When you go to do Bikur Cholim, Hamakom Yirape Eschem. What's the phrase Hamakom? What is that phrase? So it's at a point in someone's life, be it the life of an individual, be it the, the life of a people, of a nation, where we think we can't find God. We feel abandoned. We, feel, we don't feel the divine presence, the perceived presence of God. And when a person's forlorn and alone and abandoned, then we say, Baruch HaMakom. Well, let's explain. God forbid you lose a loved one, you lose a parent. A person could be 60, 80 years old. An orphan is an orphan. Your parent was your foundation. If Rahman al-Itzlan, you lose a child, you bury a child. You, the, the feeling, the sense of being alone, of being bereft, the sense of not perceiving the Almighty, at that time, it, it overcomes a person. And we say to that person, God is there with you. Hamakom. Makom literally means a place. Even in this place, you can perceive God. You can relate to God. You can reach out. You have a chance to have a relationship. The Almighty was in Auschwitz. Auschwitz. The Almighty was in Treblinka and Majdanek. In the places where you think there is no humanity, there is no nothing, there too you can find God. And we use the term Hamakom, that He's in this place. He is there. He is present in this place. Somebody, God forbid, is suffering. They're sick. They're lying on a back. They can't even take care of their bodily functions. They have no self-worth, self-dignity. They're looking at that sterile environment in the hospital room. Can you imagine that? That experience? Can you imagine that? And, and the, the doctors and nurses, even if they're good doctors and nurses, you know, they stand over them. They're basically a chart. They, the, the person themselves starts to become an object, not a subject. So the first halach of Bikr Cholim, whenever you go in when someone's sick, you have to go to their level. You don't stand over them where psychologically they have this dis, dis, disadvantage. You get down to their level where you're face to face, where you're shava b'shava, at the same height and altitude, and you're equals. And you say, Hamakom Yerape, even here where you think you've lost your sense of dignity, where you're no longer the human that you were, you no longer have the abilities, the grandeur, the, the, the dignity, the grace, the majesty that you had, God can be found here also. Even in this atmosphere, in this environment, if you can find God. Mimamakim Kerasich Hashem, the name of Rabbi Ashri Sefer, right? Mimama came out of a sense of emotional dire straits, you can reach out and call out to the Almighty. There you can find God as well. And that's why we use the word hamakom. What happened to the Jews in Egypt? Now let's apply it and answer our question. Baruch hamakom. They thought they were forlorn. Everyone had abandoned them. It was over. God forgot them. He left them. 210 years. They're going to die slaves. Their children are going to die slaves, like their parents before and them who died as slaves. We have no future. God was there with them. He was on the chain gangs. He was in the ditches that they were digging, in the fields that they were laboring. The Almighty is there with them. Hamakom. Baruch Hamakom. That God who never left them, who never forgot the covenant with Avram Avinu, the Brisbane of Sarim, that famous covenant of the historical destiny of Am Yisrael, of the Jewish nation. Baruch HaMakom, he was there throughout that period in Mitzrayim. And he's there, Shechinta Begalusa, in every exile. No matter how challenging, how difficult, 
how forlorn and, and, and rejected we may feel. God does not reject us, and God is there with us. Imo anochi vitzara. That's, I'm with them in their state of dire straits. That is baruch hamakom, baruch hu. We use that term for the Rebona Shalom before we go into the story, the analysis as to what happened to our experiences in Egypt that ultimately shaped us into the nation that would be the nation that would transform the destiny of humanity. Baruch HaMakom, Baruch Hu. We're going to end with one last point. This point, again, is from Rabbi Soloveitchik, as were the other points this evening. We could develop this to a much greater degree, but as a function of time, we're going to try to spend about 10, 12 minutes on this theme. The Hallel is very challenging Seder night. First of all, you never say Hallel at night. Right? We say Hallel on Hanukkah, you say Hallel on Yom Tov. When do you say Hallel at night? But, but more challenging than that question is, we split up the Hallel. It's not we, the Beis Hillel split up the Hallel. Beis Shammai splits up the Hallel. I mean, imagine in the morning, we start saying Hallel, and then you pull out some matzahs and you start eating dinner, or lunch, I'm sorry, you start eating at lunch, and then you finish up the Hallel after lunch. A chutzpah? You can't wait to say another fork, kapit lach the, the Hallel is all of six chapters. What is this? And why the split? If you want to split it, do three and three. No, we split it two and four. What's the whole role of the halal before the meal, the halal after the meal? Is it the same halal? How come there's no bracha by the halal? What's taking place there? What's happening Seder night that halal plays such an integral role? So uh, last year, and it's on the video from last year, we talked about the famous theme of that it's a night of didactic, it's not a historical night, it's a night of didactic history. We use history, we study history to learn principles. It's a night of profound gratitude. On the anniversary of the Jewish nation, we express our profound gratitude. That's why Arami Ovedavi, as the, the Rabbi Soloveitchik said, that's why that was chosen, not Shmos Ve'er Abo. You know, the, the Ge'onim put a cherem, they put an excommunication on the Karaites or anyone who followed the Karaite Haggadah where they would read the story because it's not about a history, it's not about a story. It's about a night of expressing our gratitude to the Almighty for everything that He's done from us. Maskel Begenus, or Messiah B'Shevach. It's a night of saying Dayenu. For each and every step of the way, we express our gratitude. We say, Kapitel Kuflam Vav, Psalm 136, Kila Olam Chasto. It's a night of gratitude, a night of halal. But going into the halal, there's two different halals taking place. The halal of the second cup, we, we call the Magid, the second cup is a radically different halal than the halal of the fourth cup. What's the difference? If you look at the text, and I heard this in the name of Rav Aaron Khan, in the name of the Rav Zatzal, if you look at the text, Psalms 113 and 114, the first two kapitlach that we say, Hallelujah and B'tseis Yisrael, it's kulo halo v'hoda. It's gratitude, it's, it's praising the Almighty, thanking the Almighty, that's what it is. Kulo halo v'hoda. And when you look at that halal, you understand why. That's the halal to quote the briskerov, the Ran alludes to this, that's shira al hanes. What's the Jew's response to encountering providence? When we encounter the, the manifestation of providence, the miraculous, where God's hand, so to speak, is reaching out, doing the miraculous for us, we break out in Hallel. Hallel betorah shira, not betorah kriya, to use the terminology. It's a Hallel of shira. It's expressing gratitude. It's praising God. It's thanking God for the imminence, for the miraculous, for, for salvation. And you know what happens during that hollow? We're transposed. We're no longer in 2011. We're in a time warp. We go back to Mitzrayim. And what do we do? We break out with gratitude and praise to God. In what? In what He has done for us. And what He has articulated for us. We break out in gratitude to God. You saved us. What is the response to the miracle? What miracle? The Rambam says, we have to demonstrate. Each and every generation, we experience as if we went out of Egypt. It is us that he took out. Not our ancestors, it's us. The bracha that we say over the second cup of wine, Seder night, it says, God redeemed us. 
as well as our fathers. But it's about us. It's our redemption. It's our transformation. It's our emancipation. It's our encountering the miraculous. We re-experience Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Pesach Doros is a reenactment in re-experiencing Pesach Mitzrayim. The Seder that we do is a reenactment. And that's what happens during the second cup. The Choldo, it's happening in each and every generation. We're experiencing our own emancipation, our own redemption, our own transformation. That is not so of the halal after dinner. It's a different halal. Yes, it's, this, it's a continuation. It's Psalm 115 and 116, 117, 118. But all of a sudden you get terms like, Ana Hashem Hoshiana, please God, please save me. Min HaMetzar Karasika, out of a sense of emotional dire straits, out of the depths, I communicate to you, I call out to you, God. Min HaMetzar Karasika. Pitach Delemoserai, please God, I'm incarcerated, I'm in chains, emotionally, break the bonds. That's not the halal of, we're free, we've made it, we're leaving Egypt. Egypt is destroyed and now the Jewish people, after 210 years, are about to fulfill our destiny. Oh, no, no. That's not the halal after, after dinner. It's a halal of, you know what? You've got BDS movements on how many hundreds of campuses. You've got anti-apartheid movements on over 100 campuses. You've got, if you were a Martian coming to Earth and you wouldn't know better, you'd think Israel's the pariah nation. You wouldn't know anything about China, about North Korea, about the Sudan, about Libya, about Syria, about Iran. No, no, all the human rights violations are, the, are Israel. We've become a pariah 70 years after the Holocaust. Anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism. It's not a simple world we live in. We have a lot to be grateful for. We have so much to be grateful for, but we have challenges. We have existential threats. We now have these, the, these rockets that are manned and operated that can attack with, with split precision. We just saw what happened to the bus last week. A child, that 16-year-old boy who had a future is laying there in a coma. We pray to God that he'll come out of that coma and recuperate. It's not a simple world we live in. It's not kulo halo v'hoda. It's a world of ana Hashem hoshiana. Please save us. It's a world of, of pitach t'lemoserai. It's, it's a world of min hametzar karasi ka. It's a very different halo. And in that halo, yes, we express our gratitude. But we petition God. We plead with God for the ultimate salvation, the ultimate redemption. Not just the redemption of what happened to the Jews, but for the total redemption of humanity. What we call geulas mashiach. That, by the way, is why you have all of these piyutim. Adir hu bimheira bikarov, bimheira, you know, build the, build the base of Mikdashun, the chad gadya. What are all these piyutim? They're a continuation of this idea. That's why Shepal Hamascha is in this stage. Because it's not a world of jubilation and, and exaltation. It's a world of challenge. It's a world that's, that man has corrupted. It's a world that needs perfection, that needs tikkun. That's a different halo. And in that halo, we add the Nishmas Kolchai, that ultimately, not only, just like we were redeemed, that great Nisan one time ago, but now we're back here into the world of reality. We're back into the present, and we ask for the ultimate redemption. What's the ultimate redemption? The redemption of all of humanity, when, of Nishmas Kolchai. That's what we ask for. And that's a very different halo. And that has conceptually a different halal. It's a different cup of wine, it has a different role, and it has a different theme than the halal that's said as we're in the time warp, as we're re-experiencing and re-enacting that great moment in history during the second cup. That's a distinction why by the base Hillel, the Chacham HaMasorah, split up the halal Seder night. Why is it said at night? We said, it's the halal of what? It's Shira al Hames. That's why there's no bracha. It's not something that we, you know, legislatively we do. It's something that we break into spontaneously because that's the Jew's response to encountering providence, the Jew's response to encountering the miraculous. And therefore there's no bracha. And that's why it can happen day or night. And of course this is at night. And that's why there's a distinction between the first two paragraphs in the second cup of wine, in the Magid section, and the last four paragraphs in the Halal section. Once again, we want to wish everyone a wonderful, from all of us here at Team OU, at the OU family, we want to wish you a wonderful, meaningful Chag, a wonderful Pesach. We always say, Benisan Nigalu, Benisan Asidim Lahigael. 
It was one time in our history, that, that famous moment in our history when we were redeemed. And we have a tradition that once again in the month of Nisan, we will be, we, we will be redeemed all over again. And that is our prayer, our fervent prayer for this year. This should be the Nisan of Asidim Lihigoyal. Bimhera Amen.